seminars in philosophy for the University of Buckingham. His most recent book is a study of uh, Wagner's Ring Cycle, and in the last few years he has reflected on religious themes such as the uh, face of God, the soul of the world, and our church. His talk this morning is on the continuing importance and presence of the Anglican Church, and now knowing about his Wagner connection, I suspect that Bill Falvey will be up here momentarily to thank him. Um, unfortunately, Sir Roger has to make an airline flight soon after, so he'll only have a few moments to shake hands, but I told him we could forgive him that. Without further ado, Sir Roger. Thank you for that kind introduction. I, I'm, uh, I was asked to talk about the relevance of the Anglican Church to the world in which we are today and its nature. This is, I was asked by Dan Cullen because I think that interests him. And I have actually written a book about this called Our Church. Um, there, in that title, the hour, that I say the first person plural, refers explicitly to England, you know, it, uh, because of course the Anglican Church is the English Church, the Church of England. And here it is no, not the Church of England that I'm addressing at all, even though Episcopal uh, uh, worship derives directly from the Anglican Communion. So it's a very interesting question as to how my church, or our church, our, our English church, connects with yours. And I will say a little bit about that, but I also want to say something more important, perhaps, about um, the meaning of the name of your church, uh, Holy Communion. Uh, the uh, settlement that you enjoy here, the, the Episcopal Church here, obviously reflects a complex history. Uh, uh, and in the 17th century, as you all know, England and Scotland were torn apart by civil war, and the origin of this civil war was largely religious. Uh, and um, had to, it was an aftermath of the Reformation and a conflict between uh, essentially uh, Presbyterian ways of thinking, which disliked the, uh, the gaudiness of the traditional Catholic rite, and wanted the religion to be brought closer to the people, and the Episcopal ways of thinking, which still wanted to hold on to the uh, ceremonies uh, and sacraments of the church, and dress them up so as to appeal to the people and to, as it were, uh, regiment their holiness, uh, their desire for holiness, into something that was more congenial to an authoritarian and traditional form of a political order. Uh, and this conflict left its stamp, uh, of course, on America, uh, which brought the Puritan Pilgrim Fathers to Massachusetts Bay, establishing a nonconformist Protestantism in the North, and of course, uh, previously had brought colonists to Virginia who had who brought with them their loyalty to the crown, and with that loyalty, a sense that the church was part of, or ought to be part of the authority of the crown, and therefore should be connected with the old idea of a, a bishopric. So um, how can an, Amer an American really be an Anglican? Obviously, uh, it's impossible. Uh, and uh, th at a certain stage, after the American Revolution, when, uh, with the break away from Britain, the Episcopal Church had to answer that question, uh, how on earth can we actually create bishops and maintain bishops of our, our own, given that in Britain, the bishops were part of the system of government who swore loyalty to the crown, and uh, were, the bishops were part of parliament, still are part of parliament, and um, the, the monarch was regarded as head of the church. So we, our Episcopal Church here, can't possibly be uh, a, a mere offshoot of that Anglican communion. Well, it, this was solved, this problem, as you know, in a characteristic American way, um, by shoving it under the carpet uh, and <laughs> saying that, that it doesn't really matter because there's an Episcopal church in Scotland which has never um, sworn loyalty to the crown and, and never accepted the queen as, as head of the church. So we'll have our uh, bishops appointed uh, by them uh, and then we'll build up our own uh, system of bishops which will be derived obliquely from the Anglican church via Scotland. 
Uh, and actually, most of America has been derived obliquely from England via Scotland. So this is not really a great difference. But it raises the question for, for you, especially in this uh, quite religious part of America with many different Protestant churches, raises the question of why bishops are important. Why should you have an Episcopal church at all? Why should you have that center of authority which stands above the community of your own congregation? Uh, and of course there is a, a constant movement in America which is part of the greatness of this uh, um, society here, a constant movement against that kind of top-down authority towards the, an authority conferred by the people themselves. Isn't that what democracy is about? Uh, so there's a, always has been and always will be a congregationalist tendency in, in American churches, um, which um, as it were, confers authority on the people themselves, the people who are worshipping, rather than the uh, offices of the church, uh, which um, are directed to the unity of the whole. Uh, and why should why should one? resist that? Why, what's so good about having a, 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 a bishopric? Well, I, I think it, that there is something very important to be said about, about the Episcopal order, that um, although congregationalism does bring the people and the, the, the worshippers together as the final authority of the church, uh, it also has a tendency to make churches purely local, um, so that they are, as it were, the creation of the people who are, who are worshipping there. Uh, and that gives, the, gives rise to the idea that actually we don't need to obey any authority except ourselves. We can just uh, be guided by the Holy Spirit in the direction that we ourselves feel inclined to go. So that the idea that there is something else to which you have to comply, comply some, some larger scheme of things, begins to dwindle and disappear into the background. And this, of course, people have seen very strongly in the Quaker movement, uh, which, uh, although it was very powerful in the 17th century, has dwindled effectively to nothing because of its failure to recognize that there is a higher and wider authority to which uh, conformity is required. Uh, of course, congregationalism um, encourages enthusiasm. When, uh, when it, we, the congregation of this little church, are the final authors of our, uh, of our obedience, then, of course, we can be enthusiastic about it. It's something which, which uh, we have chosen, which unites us in this little com community. Uh, but um, enthusiasm is not necessarily um, the, the be-all and end-all of religion, there is also uh, perhaps a more important thing, which is distance, standing back a little bit from your life, standing back from your own enthusiasms and attempting a wider view uh, of the communion with which you, in which you are united to people in other places, strangers whom you don't, do not know, uh, other people who share your search for spiritual authority but uh, nevertheless don't do it by joining with you in, works, in acts of worship or in enthusiastic displays of your own belief. And this distance uh, that I think uh, the Anglican tradition has encouraged in its congregation is a very important phenomenon because it's, it's what makes disagreement possible. Looking back to the 17th century, from which um, all the various um, um, American churches began, we see a, a century of uh, enraged conflict between people, all of whom declare themselves to be Christians, uh, even though many of them are in the business of killing and, uh, and excluding uh, their, their fellow men. And I think most people would say that that wasn't a very Christian century, even though people were adamantly declaring their belief, uh, shouting it in each other's faces, uh, with a, usually with a dagger in their hand at the same time. Uh, uh, that isn't surely what the Christian religion should be. Uh, that it should be something which involves the ability to disagree and nevertheless to be side by side in prayer with that person whose opinions you reject. 
And now, of course, there are, there are extremes of opinion which you have to reject. And nobody's expecting uh, that uh, uh, believers in the same faith should agree about, uh, um, should accept disagreement about fundamental matters. But it's the disagreement about the little things which uh, people fight over. If you look at the Middle East today, which is a great moral lesson for us all, uh, you will see the Shia and the Sunni fighting each other over something completely trivial. Uh, they, they agree about the existence of God. They agree about the, uh, the revelation granted in the Quran. They agree about the morals of everyday life. Uh, they agree about everything except that who, the question, who was the successor to the prophet? Um, and you would say, looking at it from outside, it doesn't matter a, a damn who the successor to the prophet was. Um, uh, and maybe there is no successor, or maybe I am the successor, who cares? Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, for the, um, for the uh, Muslim in the, uh, in the street, this is the most important question of all. And the per one who disagrees with him is the one about this question, is the one that he's under some kind of obligation, not just to exclude, but in emergencies, to kill. Now, we don't want our religion to be like that. Yet, of course, if we look back at the 17th century, we'll see that it was like that a bit. You know, um, certainly in England at the time of Queen Elizabeth, the question of whether you made the sign of the cross at the baptism of an infant or not, you know, absolutely not. Uh, that's what the uh, Anglican Church had decided. And a few people, you know, bewildered and, and in the enthusiasm of the moment, uh, might have made the sign of the cross as they saw their baby being baptized. And that was it. Uh, you know, you could get burned at the stake for that in the reign of, uh, of Edward. So um, th these, um, th these trivial matters... Uh, tend to dominate in times of conflict uh, and in times of peace it's our obligation to, to marginalize them and come to recognize that we, we disagree about all kinds of things connected with our faith but nevertheless the faith itself has something in common and we must try to share it as widely as possible and through the Episcopal system, in my view, we do come to share it because we are brought, to be, we're brought into relation with strangers who are not part of our congregation but nevertheless have the same spiritual needs. I think this is very obviously um, important for Americans because you have... Uh, hugely difficult issues about the nature of marriage uh, and sexuality which have been pushed uh, into your um, consciousness by the secular culture uh, and inevitably this has invaded the churches who have to make up their mind as to what uh, what it is that that should be done what does what does faith require and this requires first of all a period of discussion from which uh, to emerge with a, a resolution. And discussion and compromise and co conciliation are the great achievements of uh, Western civilization and of American civilization in particular. So that's my reason for thinking that the Episcopal Church uh, is a fundamental part of the American settlement and, and you should feel proud of it and not uh, be tempted by all those um, enthusiastic Protestants all around. <laughs> uh, but no, no, you will be. But um, so, what is the importance of this Anglican compromise, which you share? I think the most important thing for us in in Britain, and I think it's important for you too, is that the Anglican Church during the 17th century, through all those conflicts, it held on to a fundamental principle, which is that the church itself is a sacred place. It's not just an ordinary meeting hall. It's not just a place where people come together to decide issues for themselves. It has a sanctity inherited from its tradition and from history from it, and from the apostolic succession, which is bestowed upon it uh, independently of what we uh, human beings choose. It, the church is a sacred place because it administers the sacraments. Uh, and, uh, of course, much of the 17th century conflict was about that issue. The uh, uh, Puritans 
uh, in a sense, distancing themselves from the whole idea of sacraments. Calvin only acknowledged two, which were baptism and Holy Communion, because those are the only two which are clearly specified in the Gospels. Uh, and that meant that, that uh, for the uh, radical Calvinist uh, way of thinking, marriage was not a sacrament. Uh, priesthood was not a sacrament. And uh, pe penance was not a sacra sacrament. Luther, who um, agreed with Calvin about um, the, 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 those two sacraments of baptism and, uh, and the Eucharist, admitted also that penance was a sacrament. You know, that there's something holy about confessing to your sins and penitentially confronting them. And um, the, meanwhile, the, church, the, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church acknowledged seven sacraments. Now, why does this matter? Why is these conflicts over the sacraments important? I think it goes back to pre-Christian times. The Christian churches inherit from the old Jewish religion the idea of the consecration of life. The, the, the Torah, the, the first four books of the Old Testament, uh, specifies a way of life which is highly structured, in which the presence of God is acknowledged in all kinds of ways in day-to-day -day behavior and through uh, quite demanding things such as the ritual of the Sabbath, which tells you um, to stop once a week and do nothing, be futile for once. Um, and why does it ask you to do that? Of course, because that is the way in which we step back from our worldly concerns and see the world as God sees it, as something meaningful in itself. And the Jewish faith emphasizes those sort of things and emphasizes all the little rituals whereby life is not just lived, but consecrated. And I think that was inherited, of course, uh, by Christ and passed on through the message of the Gospels to all of us, uh, namely that there, there is a way of living in, in, in the world that we have, but nevertheless in the sight of God. And the way to do this is by acknowledging God's presence through sacramental uh, events, sacramental rituals, which uh, commemorate thing, the, the spiritual things that really matter to us. So this has been uh, one of the most important features of the Episcopal tradition, that it has maintained those sacraments in being, and it's one reason why the dispute over marriage is so difficult for people in the Episcopal Church and why it has to be confronted in some way. Now, the word sacrament uh, uh, is etymologically connected to that of the sacred and to the idea of sacrifice. A sacrifice... Uh, that comes from the Latin uh, sacrum facere, to, to make sacred. A sacrifice is an offering, uh, either of yourself or of something else, which makes that thing sacred. And that is what is, of course, celebrated at Holy Communion, which is why it's appropriate for me to be talking in this church about uh, the nature of a, of, uh, of a sacrament. Holy Communion... Um, is the commemoration, of course, of a, a supreme act of sacrifice, a sacrifice from which our religion be derives. That sacrifice uh, of, of Christ for the, for the redemption of mankind was, of course, uh, seen at the time, especially by his immediate followers, as a defeat. Um, after all that preaching, after that message, it seemed to lift the life of ordinary people to the level to which they aspire in their, in their highest dreams. That, that all seemed to have come to nothing at the crucifixion. And um, it, it, those of you who are interested in art might uh, look some, at some, some day at the painting of the crucifixion by Tintoretto in the um, Scuola San Rocco in, in Venice. I don't actually want you to go to Venice because too many people go there. Uh, and um, especially in, in large tourist boats full of Americans. Uh, and, and the more that happens, the less 
that likely it is that Venice will survive. But if you, if you could nevertheless look at a page of reproductions of Tintoretto's paintings and study this, the, what, the, the message that he gives in the crucifixion of that supreme defeat, which you read in the face, crumpled face of the disciples cringing at the foot of the cross and the supreme victory which will emerge from it uh, and which is represented in the sky above them. And that is, that, that is how we, we should see the, the crucifixion and how we do see it, how it is presented to us in the act of Holy Communion. It's presented as this supreme gift that a person made of himself. Um, and at the same time, through that gift, uh, recognizing that, that he was completely without power in this world, achieving the power in the world beyond which we all uh, depend upon. So, and all this is beautifully conveyed in the, in the Gospels, as you know, that in the, in, during the course of the crucifixion, uh, Christ turned the act uh, 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 that he was undergoing, the, uh, the, uh, the suffering he was undergoing, into an act of forgiveness. And uh, St. Luke records this, his words, you know, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. In other words, that uh, that was what the message that he was trying to convey to us at the same time. Look, if I can forgive this, you can forgive whatever it is that is, is afflicting you. And it's through that act of forgiveness that you will be redeemed. That is the message I have. And so we follow his example by learning the art of forgiveness. And there is a mystery in this, but we repeat this mystery every time that we uh, take Holy Communion. And that's, it's a mystery which makes sacred, you know, as, as I said, that's the etymology of sacrifice. It makes sacred not just that moment, but also the life that you bring to the altar. So we're not just remembering Christ's sacrifice, but reenacting it and reenacting it in ourselves and purifying ourselves, therefore, through the, the holy work of forgiveness. Now, making sense of the Eucharist, which I've just uh, presented to you, that making sense of it is the core of, uh, of Christianity in, in its episcopal form. Not every form of Protestantism uh, emphasizes the, the Eucharist, of course, um, uh, and um, as I say, some of the 17th century derivations of it m turn away from the sacraments altogether. But I think it is important for us that we do keep on meditating on what it means, because it's through the Eucharist that we understand the fundamental doctrine of the, uh, of the Christian church, the doctrine of the Trinity. It, it is our answer to the question, how can God, who is one, also be three? And the answer is that we experience the sacred in three completely different ways. Um, we, in our awe at creation, at the fact that there, uh, of being, that there is something rather than nothing, that, that awe-inspiring awe thought is a recognition of the sacredness of the whole of things. That's like our encounter with God the Father. And we encounter him through scientific inquiry and through wonder about, the, uh, about our immediate uh, uh, environment, just through looking out of the window, that awe can overcome you. That's one of, us, of our experiences of the, uh, of the sacred, which is very important to us. But also, we have a sense, many of us, and I think all of us wish for it, of a benign and guiding presence in our life. And um, that, again, is a sacred feeling. It can come over us at any time in all kinds of affliction. Uh, we, feel, we can feel that we are absolutely safe, no matter what is going to happen to us. And that, too, is a, a sense of the sacred, which connected with our encounter of the Holy Spirit. And again, of course, we also encounter in each other uh, the light in another person's face, the sense that when we confront another person, we are in the presence of a free being who observes us from a horizon where we can ourselves never stand, uh, addresses us uh, in a way that is, as it were, from a point outside 
the world in which we are. That's something we have with each other all the time, especially with those that we love, but it can happen with anybody. That too, uh, that is a sense of the sacred and is connected, of course, with uh, um, understanding of the incarnation of God. So those three experiences of the sacred, which are fundamental to the religious experience in our tradition, are also, of course, ways of illustrating the three, the three revelations that are granted to us of the divine presence, uh, God, uh, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and God the Son. Uh, so those three experiences are the solid ground on which we have built our religion, and it's in terms of them that we understand the nature of God. And that, that for me, is why uh, we should be grateful that we have a sacramental church. Um, but in, in my country, uh, this sacramental church, uh, as you know, has also been part of the exercise of the sovereign power. Uh, the Anglican Church in England is explicitly a patriotic church. I, I don't doubt that the Episcopal Church here in America is also patriotic, but that's because America, everything in America is patriotic. Um, but our Anglican version has a special uh, role in defining and, and upholding our loyalty to our country. And I think this is, just in conclusion, one of the things I'd like to reflect upon you know, uh, how it is that uh, a sacramental church like ours can actually contribute to our uh, secular duty towards our, uh, the, towards our um, nation and our government, uh, at the same time as fulfilling our spiritual needs. And I think it's one of the great Christian achievements, in fact, to reconcile personal piety with a secular rule of law, a law, rule of law uh, made by us. You, know, you, especially in America, you, you're aware of this. Your constitution says, it doesn't say that this is what God tells us to do. It says that this is what we, the people, have decided. Here, here is the way we're going to make our laws. We're going to make these laws. These aren't laws conferred on us by the Almighty. It's not, it's not a, an act of blasphemy to disagree with them or go against them or to, to want to change them. Uh, we, the people, are taking responsibility for our own being in this world and for the way that we are, we are governed. Obviously, this is a very important moment for you here in America uh, where you have a choice, not one that uh, uh, I envy you, um, <laughs> about exactly how this is going to go on. I said to Dan Cullen the other day, you know, that uh, there's no greater argument for hereditary monarchy than the present choice in America. <laughs> um, but uh, <clears throat> it's something that, nevertheless, which is part of your experience, that, that you take responsibility for your life, and in particular for making your laws for yourself. Uh, and, and one of the laws, the First Amendment to the Constitution, of course, uh, explicitly says that, uh, that religion is within the sphere of free choice. This is not something that, that the state has the right, uh, or, and certainly not the duty, to take charge of. Uh, that's something that we take charge of uh, for ourselves, uh, and we can uh, choose accordingly uh, uh, what religion we adhere to, provided the basic laws of, uh, of the secular state are obeyed. So, so our laws permit many religions, uh, and, um, and they put the obligations of religion to one side as private concerns. And this, I think, many, many people say, well, doesn't that mean that our communities in the West, especially in the Anglosphere, that's us and you, that they are really not religious communities at all, that we're, we are simply uh, committed to, to a secular government, and that's the end of it. But no, I think this is not so. I think that in thinking of our political order in this way, we are actually continuing a thought put in our heads by Christ himself. In the parable of the tribute money in Matthew's Gospel, as you will remember, um, Christ is asked whether, whether his followers owe the, the tribute, the, the tax that, that was demanded by the Roman authorities, whether they should um, 
pay this because after all, uh, all kinds of, in all kinds of ways, the Roman authorities were trying to displace the authority of God. Indeed, Augustus had declared himself to be a God. Uh, why should one uh, even touch this, this uh, sacrilegious coin uh, which was being demanded of them? Uh, and Christ's response was, as you know, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's meaning something much more general than taxation, but that the laws of this world are to be obeyed, provided they are not in conflict with fundamental uh, religious duties, and, um, uh, uh, and we should surrender our, uh, our uh, sovereignty to them in order to obey God in the things that matter, namely our own private and uh, uh, spiritual life, which is a life of worship, and, and um, obedience, of a, which, will, which doesn't conflict with our other duties in the public sphere. And I think we have taken that thought over 2,000 years and developed it. The Enlightenment was the last form it took, um, and uh, with the Enlightenment came the American Constitution uh, and the way in which we all live in our uh, communities now which is uh, uh, where we just accept that the secular law, the law that we ourselves make, takes precedence over everything um, that might conflict with it. Uh, and of course, we, we see when we look at the problems that Islam is having in the modern world, that the wisdom of this solution. For the Muslim, uh, law is not man-made. It's be bestowed upon us by God in an obscure uh, document uh, the meaning of which has never been properly clarified and can't be clarified now because you're not allowed to comment on it. Um, uh, and it, uh, it conflicts at, at, at every point with the man-made laws uh, that Western uh, uh, communities have uh, imposed upon themselves. Uh, so there is a, a, an irreconcilable conflict arising and I think we should be thankful that we have understood through our idea of a sacramental religion just how religion can address the spiritual needs of its uh, congregation without imposing upon it, that congregation, a, a single monolithic uh, uh, conception of, of unchangeable law. So our religious duty, in, uh, as we have understood it, is to tolerate differences and this has made, been made easier by the sacraments because through the sacrament we consecrate our lives. Uh, and we do this not by killing God's opponents but by respecting each human being as sacred in himself. And I think that is the message that I take from Holy Communion and I have very strongly the feeling that it's a message that is preached in, in this church. So, thank you. Hmm. Yeah, um, questions. If, sorry. Evangelism? Uh, well, yes, evangelism was part of the um, 17th century norm. You know, um, people preach, it was so strong that the, a law w was passed forbidding it, essentially forbidding preaching outside the church and without the permission of the church. John Bunyan was in prison for preaching in the street. You know, now, John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress, Pilgrim's Progress is one of the great works of Christian literature. We're very grateful that Bunyan existed. But at the time, he was as big a nuisance as could be uh, because uh, he was stirring up crowds to, uh, to um, express their disapproval of the existing institutions. So it's, you know, evangelism, uh, evangelism is of two kinds, I think. One where you address a given congregation in circumstances where it is relatively contained uh, and then the other where you stir up feelings uh, among strangers, among people you don't know and, and essentially incite people to, to 
uh, uh, rebellion or to violence and so on. Now that second kind of evangelism we've seen all in the Middle East. As you know, the um, ISIS in, uh, in Syria uh, has spread its message around the world uh, through a kind of evangelism which uh, stirs up young people to, to kill mercilessly in, in the cause of Allah. Uh, and it's one of the, it's a huge problem that we now have confronting. So I think evangelism should never be seen as a, an un, unmixed good. It ha if it's contained, yes, but not if it's just out there in the, in the public sphere, regardless of who it's stirring up. Sir, how do you uh, characterize your church's response to the challenge of the refugees? Uh, well, I don't think the Anglican Church has as such responded, except um, uh, we all have to respond in, in ourselves. And um, I think the, the, the easy response from the point of view of your own conscience is to say, the people, these are people in need who have, no, who have nothing, we should take them in because after all, that not that what, uh, what is commanded by, uh, in the second great commandment of love thy neighbor as thyself? Um, but I, I think that's too simple because there isn't room for them. And of course, if of all the possible, all the possible refugees, you know, there, there are something like seven billion people in the world who want to live in England or America. Nobody wants to live anywhere else. Uh, and um, <coughs> there isn't room in England and America for these seven billion people. So you have to, have a, you have to recognize that, that the only reason why they flee to the Anglosphere, which is what they do, is because the Anglosphere has maintained that kind of law and order and stability, which enables it to, to function as a refuge. But it won't function as a refuge if it's overwhelmed. So you would defeat the purpose of taking people in if you took in everyone. Uh, but that means you're only taking in some. So what defines the privilege? You know, uh, and my own view is that uh, when you come as a stranger seeking hospitality, you have an obligation to uh, accept his way of life. You know, I, I, I w in the impossible situation that I was um, a refugee from from Putin's Europe, seeking, uh, seeking shelter in, in a, a new Syria, say. Um, I, I would certainly uh, think seriously about what I have to do, uh, you know, how, how to obey the local law. I wouldn't start trampling around the, the mosque with my shoes on. Uh, and uh, I would make a serious effort to learn the language and uh, respect the customs. But, uh, you know, that is a, 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 that has always been the case in America that you ask people to do that. Uh, uh, Europeans, on the whole, don't, and especially Germans don't ask, ask the, the newcomers to conform to anything because they're so self-conscious about their previous attempt to make everyone conform, you know. Um, so it's a very difficult question, and I don't think there's a simple Christian answer to it. Um, you can't, Christ tells us to turn the other cheek, you know, when, when attacked. But he didn't tell us to turn the cheek of the child whom we're protecting to, to, to his attacker. And likewise, you know, we, so we have responsibilities for those who are, uh, who are in our charge that we have to fulfill before we can open our arms to the world as a whole. Roger, your, your book is called Our Church, mm. and yet there's a chapter in it entitled My Church. Mm. Given what you said earlier about how one can think of, of church going as a local matter, but there's something to be said about the distance and the hierarchy and, and so on, could you say a little bit about why your own local church is important to you or how it became important to you? 
And who's playing the organ there this Sunday when you're not there? Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> there, is, there, there, are, there are a few uh, characters of my age who can, uh, who can manage to play, uh, play the hymn with one finger. Uh, and so it's, uh, it, it survives. My, my church is important to me partly because it, it, it was a, my effort to settle down in a particular place when I made that effort uh, seemed to suggest that I should also take seriously uh, the, the, not just the religion of that place but the, but the, uh, the, the building and the ritual through which God had been invited into that place as well. You know, that, that, that you, I think it's a fundamental part of settling down that you join in the, uh, the ambient holiness of the place. And so that's what it re represented for me. So I, I, I started going to the church and recognizing they hadn't got an organist, so I volunteered. And that's, a great, that's great because it means I have to go to the church Whatever, whatever the state of, of my doubt on that Sunday morning, you know, so uh, I'm carried through, much like a priest. You know, I know that pr uh, many uh, priests go through dark moments of doubt. You know, is, is this all nonsense? Uh, what am I doing? Um, uh, and uh, yet, thanks to their office, are carried through those moments of doubt um, into the light on the other side. And I think that's something that um, has always been important to me. But of course, it's uh, yeah. I think that's probably enough, really. Um, uh, it, well, it, the, the, there are lots of neighbours, of course, come, come from that church, um, including you know, there's our nearest neighbour, whose uh, whose attitudes to the world are entirely suburban, who won't let our hunt across her land. You know, I have to swallow my indignation. Uh, as we kneel beside each other at the communion rail, um, and she has to swallow hers, uh, and this is all rather good for the community. Um, I know increasingly in Europe and the United Kingdom, even the United States, young people are more and more identifying themselves as non-religious or they don't mm. show a commitment to church. So what might you say to young people about why church is a worthy um, obligation or venture to commit yourself to? Mm. Well, it's difficult, of course, uh, um, to gain the ears of young people because they are in a state of distraction always and um, there are so m we live in a world of temptation uh, in which um, that's the whole economy is, de is devoted to manufacturing temptations you know and, and the internet and all the rest we're all familiar with this and young people are vulnerable um, we have to stay put waiting for the crisis uh, it, most young people of any decency will enter that crisis at a certain stage and say, what is the meaning of all this? You know, um, okay, she left me, uh, and, that, and the, that's what they do, uh, but why is it that I had nothing that I could offer that would, would make the relationship permanent or something like that? And then but that, all, that shows that, some, that they're already turning in another direction, looking for that permanent thing in... in uh, uh, to which they can come home. And I think that's, what a, that's really what a church should be. It should be offering that home, however distant that home is at the moment, it, it, it is a place of safety and you will be welcome. Uh, and if young people go through that life knowing that, if they, uh, they will come back in the end. That's my, my feeling. Uh, I noticed that you did a stint with the American Enterprise Institute. Mm. Um, how did you get there? What did you do among them? Could you kind of characterize for us what that is? Yes. Um, I, 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 I was a university professor until about 1994, I think it was, uh, and I left the university world and have since been freelancing, doing all sorts of bits and pieces, trying to live by writing and 
uh, and giving talks and, and so on. Uh, and uh, at a certain stage, I lived in, well, my, we lived, our family lived in, in Virginia, in, in Sperryville, Virginia. And um, then I really needed a job to pay a mortgage because banks require regular income, as you know, before they lend you any money. Um, and I w was lucky enough to get a, a, a um, job, short-term contract, with a, um, a psychological, uh, in a postgraduate psychological institute in Arlington. And then I, I was working on environmental philosophy, and uh, the, um, a, uh, the American Enterprise Institute offered me a, a sort of resident scholarship to pursue that for a year. Um, and it wasn't renewed um, because I think, largely because my approach is not that of the American Ent Enterprise Institute. I'm not a, a free market maniac. Uh, uh, you know, I, reckon, uh, I have a much more European conception of what's at stake in the environmental movement than, than many of the uh, supporters of AEI would have. So I don't, uh, my, my contract was not renewed. And, um, but I mean, no hard feelings or anything, um, because I managed to write the book that I was uh, due to write. But it, it, it is a, an interesting institution. We've got nothing like that in, in, in Britain. It's, I think it's the oldest think tank in, in Washington. It was founded in the war, you know, uh, 75 years ago, I think. No, 65 years ago. Um, and, um, no, 75, I think. Uh, and, um, represents a particular kind of American conservatism bound up with the interests of big business uh, and a belief in the American idea that, that uh, through free enterprise we can solve all our problems uh, and a hostility to state-engendered solutions. Uh, and, and that's a, a very salutary position. It's useful to have people saying that, but it's only half the truth. You know, but uh, I think it's been an inspiration for many people in America that there's someone saying this. Right. Uh, where did you get the title, sir? Uh, well, uh, where? You know, I picked it up from the gutter. <laughs> uh, but, or someone did, um, and then waved it in front of the Queen, who said, okay. Mm. All right, well. Uh, several times you referred to the enthusiasm of students. Is that what particular means uh, during Enthusiasm. Yeah, during the particular uh, Well, yeah. Uh, um, I think, yes, in the 17th century, enthusiasm was uh, recognized as a problem. Um, we, we, you can use lots of different words for it. Frenzy, uh, bigotry, uh, you know. Um, what, what, I, what I meant was the, uh, the total commitment to a single point of view, which annihilates the, the rights of any opponent. You know, that's, that kind of thing is, is part of human nature to give way to this. If you look at back over European history, there have been moments of enthusiasm, you know, which hold mass movements sweeping across society, uh, a millenarian movement saying that, that, you know, the day of judgment is nigh. Um, uh, and all, we're all familiar with it, and we're going through one at the moment in the, in the Islamic world. Um, and we went through one at the French Revolution, uh, and its usual consequences are genocide and, um, and total disorder. So I'm not in favor of enthusiasm, when it's at, not when it's out of control. I mean, my enthusiasm for the music of Richard Wagner, however, is a completely different thing. Uh, um, I have not yet murdered any anti-Wagnerian, and, and on the whole, I control myself in the presence of such people. Well, um, 
The, the EU, of course, was f uh, originated with the agreements <coughs> like the Treaty of Rome made by, by Roman Catholics, actually, were Roman Catholic believers, most of them, uh, uh, and um, between nations in which Roman Catholicism was the, uh, uh, not official, but standard faith of the people. So it, it was conceived in something like uh, um, Catholic, Roman Catholic terms, but I don't think that has ever been part of the motive that the British people had for, for not going along with it. Uh, and I, th I don't think it, the religious aspect of, of it has really impacted on people. And the, the Brexit vote has much more to do with um, the fact that we in Britain are used to making our own laws uh, and refuse to have them made for us, uh, and um, you know, which is a, a, an attitude which you have here as well. Uh, and um, it's always been odd to us that, that so many American politicians have been in favor of the European Union because they, none of them would ever accept it here. Um, and when Barack Obama came over especially to say that we had to vote to stay in the European Union, that clinched it for most people. <laughs> um. We've got one last question. I was just wondering what your feelings were about the Anglican Church of Jerusalem. Uh, it's great that there's an Anglican church in Jerusalem, but um, Jerusalem is, a, 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 as everybody knows, is, um, it, it isn't really a, a place in this world. Um, you know, uh, the Arabs call it Al-Quds, the, the, the holy place meaning that it isn't actually here. Um, it's somewhere else, but revealed if you're standing in that spot. Uh, and all the religions, uh, you know, all the monotheistic religions are fighting for a little place there. If you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you will see just what it is, what religious conflict is. People who believe, all believe the same thing, except some tiny thing about whether you should make the sign of the cross with two fingers or three, you know, they have little chapels of their own uh, and threatening to murder each other if, if their boundaries are, uh, are transgressed. So I think it's a very interesting uh, lesson in just what a force religion is. And it's quite good that the Anglican Church is present there because we can at least tell people that it doesn't matter, you know, it's all okay. Uh, you can just live with other people uh, as we uh, English speakers do, namely by ignoring them. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Um, Sir Roger, thank you so, so much. Um, we, I'd also like just to make two quick acknowledgments that I should have made at the beginning. Uh, Sir Roger's presence with us is a partnership that we had with Rhodes College and particularly with Dan Cullen from their political science department. So thank you to our friends at Rhodes for making that possible. Uh, and thank you also to my associate rector, Ben Badgett, and to the speakers committee that he's been working with uh, for making this happen. We're just so, so grateful and so much work went in behind the scenes uh, to make this all happen. So thank you again so much for being here. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>